Barack Obama's Senate seat sale, S-A-L-E. He goes to jail and your boy lets him out. Who let your cousin out? I got a friend. Went to penitentiary for a murder he didn't commit. Stayed 19 years there. And nobody let him out. And he didn't even do the crime. Rob did it. But these are the people y'all letting out. So, guess what? I'm gonna, uh, watch this, watch this. The last governor that was a re Republican was this dude named Jim Ryan in Illinois. He was the governor from the time I was born until I was about 25. I'm 50 now. Since him, it has not been a Republican governor in the state of Illinois. But Donald Trump let this Democratic governor out. And if you don't think that's a favor for a favor in the future, you out your damn mind. So, oh man, this don't involve, they're going to do what they want to do. They ain't going to help. Okay. 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 See, it's the long game, man. It ain't the short game. It's the long game. And if you don't want to do it, if you don't mind, go ahead, bro. Do your thing. This dude ain't crazy. He ain't ignorant. He ain't stupid. He ain't none of that stuff that y'all been told. Hey, look, 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 he's a creepy. Well, you letting him do it, family. Hey, hey, look, look, check this out. Donald Trump. Is he ignorant, my oh, man? He ignorant. I can't stand him. But why ain't y'all talking about Mitch McConnell, who got the Breonna Taylor, who got the who got the Breonna Taylor uh, uh, Attorney General in his back pocket, who got your stimulus package that all of us waiting on in his back pocket? See, Donald Trump is the front man. He's the puppet. He's the he's the face behind Oz. But Mitch McConnell. Ted Cruz and the uh, 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 what, uh, L L L Lindsey Graham, they are the Oz that are controlling the puppet that we know as Donald Trump. I'm just letting you know why there are three equal branches of the United States federal government, judicial, legislative, and the executive. Why ain't they getting them under control? So you go, Trump crazy, Trump crazy. Trump ain't smart enough or politically savvy enough to work this number that he working. Mitch McConnell is because he's been in play since Linda Baines Johnson. Cruz is because he's been in play for a minute. Lindsey Graham been in play since I was in my 20s and I just told y'all I'm 50. So the people who are around him are working their number. Stop being focused on the pup. Look, look. I know this is going to seem kind of corny, but to quote Bruce Lee, do not stare at my finger as you will miss all the glory of the sky. Do not stare at Donald Trump or, or as you will miss all the crooks that are standing behind him. And with that being said, I'm going to take a small break, and I'll be right back to close out the show. Creates space, and he's fouled, and will go to the line. This has been, a, this has been the Jarnell Stokes Show, and he has... Former NBA player and wellness advocate Jarnell Stokes is the owner of Stokes Superfoods. Stokes Superfoods brings the purest form and highest quality products to those who want to turn the tables and take responsibility for their health. Educate people on the power of returning to nature and the holistic inner self. Our products cannot heal any disease alone, but we're here to assist in the healing process for both the mind and body. Stoke Superfoods are highly recommended. For more information, please click on the link in my description box below.
During the 80s crack era, jobs were ripped out of the black community in the blink of an eye. And they replaced those jobs with crack. If you strip away a man's resources, if you take away his ability to feed his family, and you give him drugs, what did you think was going to happen? You're going to use it or you're going to sell it? Even myself as a law-abiding citizen, if you take away my ability to feed my kids, I will commit crimes. If I can't legally feed my kids, I'm committing crimes because my kids will eat regardless, by any means necessary. In the early 80s, just as the drug war was kicking off, inner city communities were suffering from an economic collapse. The blue collar factory jobs had suddenly disappeared. For black men, these were some of the go-to jobs. During the 50s, the 60s, and 70s, this is how black men ate. This is how they fed their families. Prior to 1970, inner city workers with relatively little or formal education could find work close to home. Manufacturing jobs were transferred by multinational corporations away from American cities to countries that lacked unions. So the jobs were gone, the income was depleted, and it was chaos. And on top of that, they gave us crack. And the war on drugs began. America, it will be government-wide, pulling together the nine different fragmented areas where, within the government in which this problem is now being handled. Studies show that people of all colors use and sell illegal drugs. If there are any differences, surveys are to be found that frequently suggest that whites, particularly the youth, are far more likely to engage in drug activities. There are more white users and more white drug dealers. In major drug infested cities, nearly 80% of young black men have criminal records. When you look at the nation's prisons and jails, they are overflowing with black drug users and drug dealers. It may be surprising to some, but the drug crime was declining, not rising, when the drug war was declared. From a historical perspective, however, the lack of correlation between crime and punishment is nothing new. Sociologists have frequently observed that the government's use of punishment is primarily as a tool of social control. Most people assume that the war on drugs was launched in a response to the crisis caused by crack cocaine. This view holds that the racial disparities in drug convictions and sentences, as well as the rapid explosion of the prison population, reflect nothing more than the government's zealous but benign efforts to address the rapid drug crime in poor communities. I mean, this view is understandable, given the sensational media coverage of the crack cocaine in the 1980s and the 1990s, but it's simply wrong. If we're going to have a successful offensive, we need more money. Consequently, I'm asking the Congress for $155 million in new funds, which will bring the total amount this year in the budget for drug abuse, both in enforcement and treatment, to over $350 million. As far as the new money is concerned, incidentally, I have made it clear to the leaders that if this is not enough, if more can be used, if Dr. Jaffe, Jaffe, after studying this problem, finds that we can use more, more will be provided. While it is true that the publicity surrounding crack cocaine led to the dramatic increase in funding the war on drugs, but there is no truth to the notion that the war on drugs was launched in a response to crack cocaine. 
On October 14, 1982, President Ronald Reagan officially declared the war on drugs, doubling down on an initiative that was started by Richard Nixon. Reagan declared that illicit drugs were a direct threat to U.S. national security. And through a series of legislation, we had the outcome of mandatory minimum sentencing laws of 1986. In 1986, when I was coming of age, Ronald Reagan doubled down on the war on drugs that had been started by Richard Nixon in 1971. Drugs were bad, fried your brain, and drug dealers were monsters. The sole reason neighborhoods and major cities were failing. No one wanted to talk about Reaganomics and the ending of social safety nets, the defunding of schools and the loss of jobs in cities across America. Young men like me who hustled became the sole villain and drug addicts lacked moral fortitude. In the 1990s, incarceration rates in the U.S. blew up. Today we imprison more people than any other country in the world. China, Russia, Iran, Cuba. All countries we consider autocratic and repressive. Yeah, more than them. Judges' hands were tied by tough-on-crime laws, and they were forced to hand out mandatory life sentences for simple possession and low-level drug sales. My home state of New York started this with Rockefeller laws. Then the feds made distinctions between people who sold powder cocaine and crack cocaine even though they were the same drug. Only difference is how you take it. And even though white people used and sold crack more than black people, somehow it was black people who went to prison. The media ignored actual data to this day. Crack is still talked about as a black problem. The NYPD raided our Brooklyn neighborhoods while Manhattan bankers openly used coke with impunity. The war on drugs exploded the U.S. prison population disproportionately locking away black and Latinos. Our prison population grew more than 900%. When the war on drugs began in 1971, our prison population was 200,000. Today it is over 2 million. Long after the crack era ended, we continued our war on drugs. There were more than 1.5 million drug arrests in 2014. More than 80% were for possession only. Almost half were for marijuana. People are finally talking about treating addiction to harder drugs as a health crisis. But there's no compassionate language about drug dealers. Unless, of course, we're talking about places like Colorado, whose state economy got a huge boost by the above-ground marijuana industry. A few states south in Louisiana, they're still handing out mandatory sentences for people who sell weed. Despite a boom in its celebrated 50 billion legal marijuana industry, most states still disproportionately hand out mandatory sentences to black and Latinos with drug cases. If you're entrepreneurial and live in one of the many states that are passing legalized laws, you may still face barriers participating in the above-ground economy. Venture capitalists migrate to these states to open multi-billion dollar operations, but former felons can't open a dispensary. Lots of times those felonies were drug charges, caught by poor people who sold drugs for a living, but are now prohibited from participating in one of the fastest growing economies. Got it? In states like New York, where holding marijuana is no longer grounds for arrest, police issue possession citations in black and Latino neighborhoods at a far higher rate than other neighborhoods. Kids in Crown Heights are constantly stopped and ticketed for trees. Kids at dorms in Columbia, where rates of marijuana use are equal to or worse than those in the hood, are never targeted or ticketed. Rates of drug use are as high as they were when Nixon declared this so-called war in 1971. Forty-five years later, it's time to rethink our policies and laws. The war on drugs is an epic fail.